Hello and welcome. We are thrilled that you have chosen to join us for worship today. As we come together, there are several announcements that we have to lift before you. The first is that this is our first week of using our live streaming equipment to record the service for Worship by Wire. So this service is going to look a little different than previous Worship by Wire services. We are still following a COVID-conscious way of recording so that all who are a part of this important work remain safe. I invite you to engage with a video that the bishop and representatives from the East Ohio Delegation to General Conference held on the 13th of March. In this conversation, they presented all about the May special call general conference that is approaching. You can find that video on the East Ohio Conference website, eocumc.com. Lent, Holy Week, and Easter Lent is now well underway. Holy Week and Easter are quickly approaching. For more information about the variety of worship experiences available to you for Lent and Easter, we encourage you to see the Lent page of the church's website. On this page, you will find information about the sensory service, our Monday Thursday service, Good Friday worship opportunities, as well as Easter services, and information about the Run to Resurrection fundraiser. Lent kits are still available in the gathering area. Maybe you have one already, but I invite you to consider picking one up to deliver to someone who can't make it to the facility to pick one up. The outdoor Lenten prayer wall is available at the Circle Drive entrance on 9th Street. Use the ribbons in your Lent kit or the ribbons provided at the prayer wall to weave a prayer into the wall for yourself or on behalf of someone else. We also have two collections currently underway. The first is for the Hartville Mission, and the second is for Faith Kitchen. Information on both collections, including a list of needed items, is available in the weekly Navigator. We invite you to consider all of the other ways that you can participate in the life of the church outside of Worship by Wire, including the many adult group opportunities that you can find on our website, Wednesday Night Live each week at 6 p.m., our virtual lobby conversations at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning, and our Spiritual Practices 101 videos, which will help you to explore a wide variety of faithful practices. And now I want to invite Pastor Steve up for a special announcement. Normally this announcement would be given by one of our staff parish relations committee members because it has to do with our staff. I wanted to announce to you that our director of our Faith Friends Learning Center, Jessica Dent, uh, has announced that she will be resigning uh, effective May 7th. And the purpose or the reason for that is because Uh, Her family is going to be moving to Virginia where her husband has found a new job. And so we pray for Jessica in her transitions. I also want to let you know that we are beginning to post already for the opening position. We invite anyone and everyone to help get the word out. That is going to be a a challenging position uh, to find the right person, but we're confident that we will do so. We've got a search team that's already working on that. So help us get the word out. We want to hire someone hopefully by mid-April. In addition, we continue now to uh, pursue the uh, applications for our custodial positions. We have two custodian positions available, um, and we already have interims. As you know, we're grateful for John Hartzell and for David Wadlington. They've been filling that. Uh, But we now are opening that up for applications to be received over the next three weeks. And for those positions, too, uh, two part-time positions, we hope to fill those by the middle of April. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. Again and again, we come to this space. Again and again, we gather as a community Again and again, we move closer to God. And again and again, God is here. We are met, we are heard, we are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship holy God.
invite the children and the children at heart to come gather around. I love the words to the hymn we just sang and a beautiful reminder that all children are welcome in this space as we gather to worship God on today, this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent is a special season of the church year in which we prepare to celebrate Easter. We spend time thinking about how God loves us. Lent is a season when we think about what we can do to grow closer to God and to more fully love God and others and live the way that Jesus wants us to live. This Lent at Faith United, our theme is again and again. And each week during Lent, we will consider how again and again God claims us and names us God's beloved children. And that message is meant for each and every one of you, no matter how young or old you are. You will see this symbol, the ampersand or the and sign throughout the season of Lent as we think about how God connects us to God's word and to each other and how God is with us in and through all things. This week, we are exploring that again and again, God loves us first. Now, I think many of you know that I love books. Books are a great way to learn about God's love. And I wanted to share a few of my favorites with you this morning. The first is a book called Love, written by Matt de la Piena. I love the illustrations in this book and the beautiful, diverse portrayals of family, home, and unconditional love. The book feels like a giant loving hug every time I read it. You will find a link to a reading of this book in this week's Sunday School activities. And I want to encourage you, as you see the beautiful illustrations, to maybe draw a picture of what love looks like to you. Another favorite book is this one called No David. Now, at first, this book might seem like it's re not really about love. It's the story of a rowdy elementary age boy who is constantly getting into trouble. He jumps on his bed, he chews with his mouth open, he plays baseball in the house. Can any of you relate to that? I, th I think so. But page after page, his mother is constantly telling him, sometimes even yelling, David, stop. David, I said no. But then at the end of the book, we see a very sad looking David. His eyes are brimming with tears and his arms are held wide open for a hug. And the mother simply says, yes, David, I still love you. Now, I think if we were to place ourselves in the story, we would be David. We mess up and we make mistakes all the time. And if we are like David, then God would be like the mother in this story, saying to us again and again, yes, I still love you. I will always love you. This book, which is really more like a whole library rather than just one book, the Bible is sometimes even called the story of love. It is the story of God's love for the world and for each and every one of you. I hope that you read a few verses from the Bible every day so that you will grow in understanding God's amazing love for you. I want you to know how much you are loved. God made you out of love so that you can share love with others in everything that you do. Know that there is nothing that you can do that will make God love you any more or any less because God has loved you from the very beginning. Isn't that an amazing gift? And the best part of this gift is that God invites you to join God in helping others know that they are also loved children of God. So this week, I want to encourage you to tell someone that they are loved, loved by you, 
and loved by God. Maybe your families can take turns saying what you love about each other at dinner one night. Or maybe you can send a card to a friend or a relative saying what you love about them. But most important of all, remember to remind them that they are loved children of God because God loves us first. And again and again, as God shows us the way and calls us to listen, we are reminded that God's love is amazing and bigger than anything that we can imagine. And that God invites you to be part of this journey of spreading God's love throughout the whole world. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us from the very beginning. Help us to begin everything we do or say with love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to this moment of offering, we continue to reflect on this theme. Again and again, God loves first. We believe that God loved first, that God breathed life into dust, and that God said, this is good. As a response to the way that God loves us, we seek to build lives that reflect that love in prayer, in work, in play, and in generosity. Amen.
gracious and amazing God, your love for us is beyond anything that we can imagine. Again and again, you remind us that you loved us first. And because of your love for us, you call us to love others. So we pray that you will bless these gifts, multiply their use, and use them to spread your love in amazing ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture for today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised him, us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come now to the sharing of stories of God at work in our lives through both our celebrations and our concerns. We have these concerns to lift before you today. Kathy Jordan was admitted to Akron General last week with pneumonia, pleurisy, and a blood clot. She is on medication and hopes to be back home soon. Our youth director, Amy Ferguson, will be having surgery for a hernia and mesh repair Prayers for a safe surgery and a smooth recovery. Amy has made preparations so that all youth ministry will continue. Prayers for Greg Eisenbry, his mother Betty, and sister Linda as they continue to recover at home from COVID-19. Prayers for the family and friends of Rachel Harper. Rachel passed away March 7th after her battle with cancer. The family will be arranging a private service. And I want to thank you for all of the prayers and notes and love that have been expressed to myself and to my family after the sudden and unexpected death of my father. Join me in a time of silent prayer, a pastoral prayer, and the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, from wherever we are, make us aware of your presence with us. Engage with us in this time of silence. God, you reach out to us with your grace, prevenient grace, grace that goes first. And you reveal to us your love for us. We are grateful for that love. We are grateful for the invitation to life with you. We pray for all who are in need of healing. Those names just a few moments ago and those who are in need of healing throughout the world. We ask for wisdom for doctors, nurses, and other health care providers as they seek to care for all people. We pray for those experiencing grief. For those experiencing grief as the result of losing someone they love, for those experiencing grief as a result of major life transition, 
for those experiencing grief as a result of circumstances related to injustice. We pray for all who are on waiting lists and who are waiting to be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. We give thanks for all those who have worked diligently to formulate a vaccine. We know that all good gifts come from you, and in this season, we are reminded of the good gifts that you have given to the world's scientists and leaders in vaccine development. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for holding us. Thank you for this community in which you have planted us. We pray now together the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. What an absolute joy it is to be engaging in worship start to finish instead of pieces, parts, the way we've been doing it for the past year uh, for the sake of safety and for quality of recording. I'm so grateful to hear Joanne sing and our other musicians play and uh, to be in this space together. We look forward to some point in the near future when we can begin to worship together in person. Continuing in our series, again and again, I invite you to listen for the Word of God as it comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate 
the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Let us pray. Well, God, as we offer ourselves in a time of worship, we pray that you would allow every part of our minds and our hearts and our bodies to be free to truly worship, to experience and receive your living word. And so may it be that your word indeed takes up new life in our hearts so that our lives may reflect your grace and the coming of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My guess is that many, if not most, maybe even all who are participating in this experience of worship have heard at least a part of the scripture from John's reading this morning. John 3.16 has been plastered, uh, perhaps more than any other verse in the Bible has been uh, revealed and exposed and put out there. It's on sports arenas. It's, it's just about everywhere. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I find it helpful to just know a little bit about what's happening. And you can find this out for yourself. I encourage you maybe this week to go back and read. This is in chapter 3 of John's gospel. Go back and read the beginning. And what you'll find is that Jesus is not just speaking to the crowds. He's not just speaking to the disciples. We can hear it that way for all of us now. But in the context of the scripture, he is speaking to Nicodemus. So you remember the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. He knew the Hebrew scriptures. And something about Jesus intrigued him. Something about the work and ministry that Jesus was doing already in John's gospel so early in his ministry prompted Nicodemus to go and to talk with Jesus. Now, this is also, you'll remember, following chapter 2 in John's gospel. And last week, we heard what happens in chapter 2. Jesus overthrowing the tables in the temple and causing all kinds of ruckus and saying, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it. And the Pharisees are upset with him. The religious authorities are upset. In fact, John's gospel is the only gospel that has that place in the beginning. The others have it at the end, right before Jesus is taken to the cross, which is probably more chronologically correct because it would make sense that that would be the tipping point that would lead them to convict Jesus. What a blasphemy to come and cause such havoc in the temple. So that's the background. And remember, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, so all of his people would be already against Jesus, already questioning his authority, already suspicious of who this radical rabbi, who does he think he is. And yet, something in Jesus' actions calls Nicodemus to want to find out a little bit more. And so he goes to Jesus, but mind you, he goes at night, under the cover of darkness, shrouded in, in privacy. And if you read that chapter in 3 before our passage, you'll find that Nicodemus asks Jesus about the kingdom, and Jesus tells him everyone must be born again from the Spirit. And Nicodemus is confused, and that is the background to where Jesus says to him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Can you relate to Nicodemus? Is there a part of Jesus that intrigues you? And is there a part of Jesus that you want to kind of keep private? You don't really want others to know that you're spending time talking to Jesus. Is there a part of you that fits into both of those molds. I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked in our staff meeting for devotion this week. Uh, in our staff, we still meet almost every week, and we're still doing it by Zoom for the safety of, of COVID. And um, my question was, after reading this passage, and I read the whole passage from verses 14 to 21, and I said, tell me, 
from this passage, what do you feel is the absolute most important message that the world needs to hear? Now, let me just back up for a minute because I've been focusing on that one verse, 16. God so loved the world, gave his only son. But I want to remind you about some of the other parts in that passage when you read on about those who believe are saved and those who do not believe are not saved and those who believe are not condemned and those who do not believe are condemned. That's some heavy stuff. What would you say? What would be your sermon? What would be the message that you would want to proclaim? What does the world need to hear from this passage? We've got great staff. They are all dedicated followers of Jesus Christ, and they are seeking to become more and more like him. And so I was grateful for their reflections. I'm going to share them with you, at least a little bit of the summary. Cheryl, Director of Finance Administration, she was the first one to share, and she said the most important thing would simply be that God did not come to condemn. Just think what that could do if the world really got a hold of that truth, that promise. God did not come to condemn. Dennis, our worship arts coordinator, he shared that he felt like the message is, it isn't too late. It isn't too late. And by extension, perhaps even to say it is never too late that we have a God of such abundance that message that God so loved the world, it is never too late to come into that belief. Can you imagine if all the world could truly get a hold of that? Kathy, director of spiritual formation, she, she thought about how this passage really emphasizes to us, especially us who have already professed to be on a journey with Christ, the importance of sharing the good news with others. How critical it is that we witness so that others might come into that profound experience of life that truly is life in a relationship with Christ, the gift of God. Amy shared that it's a profound thought just simply to emphasize that God's desire is that we walk through that door. In other words, It is God's greatest hope and intention that everyone will come into this life-giving relationship with Christ. That the emphasis is not about those who will be forever cut outside, but the emphasis on the invitation to come into life in Christ. Pastor Jake shared about a reference from Anna Carter Florence, who is a great preacher and a teacher of preaching. And, uh, and how he recalled that she once spoke and how she talked about how this passage has in the history of the church at many times been in fact a passage that creates division. It seems to emphasize who's in and who's out. When in fact, Jake affirms that Anna Carter Florence affirms that it is just the opposite that this passage is meant to bring everybody everybody into saving full life in Christ. I asked Al Martinson. Al is, uh, if you don't know Al, uh, Al is Pam Wiggs' brother, and Al grew up in this church, and he's a handyman, and so the trustees has hired Al to do some remodeling of the bathrooms at the Parsons. So I've been seeing Al every day coming to the Parsons to do some work on our bathrooms, and I asked him this week, I said, Al, what do you think about this passage? What do you think? is the real message that people need to hear. And he said, to me, to me it says that no matter what anyone has done in the past, there's always hope. No matter what anyone has done in the past, there is always hope. Again, I ask, what what is your take? What do you feel is most important for the world to hear in this passage? I found myself really asking, what does it mean to believe? So much seems to be riding on that statement. 
For those who believed are not condemned, and those who do not believe are already condemned. And God so loved the world that he gave his own son that those who ever believe it. There's a lot that, that rides on that belief. And I began to wonder, so much of the problems that we've encountered over the centuries in the church seems to come from Christians trying to decide who's a real believer and who's not, who's in and who's out. How's anyone really going to know what another person believes deep in their heart? Let me even push the question farther. Do you really know what you believe? How do you know? How do you know that that's what you really believe? We have such a capacity for self-deception. We have such built-in self-protective mechanisms that it's hard to know. Is this what you really, really believe? You can say you believe this. Especially when it comes to a profession of faith that you believe in Jesus Christ. Let me remind you, at the end of the passage, he talks about how the world loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so there's, there's some talking about the importance of deeds. And I, I think that this ties into the fact that belief in actions, what we believe in the things that we do, the decisions that we make, need to go hand in hand. In fact, if we want to really, really know what we believe or what somebody else believes, don't we usually look and see what their actions are, what their life looks like? Well, let me invite you to do an examination of your own belief. I didn't come up with this, but I've always thought it was a powerful truth, and it is a statement that if you want to find out where your real priorities are, what your real beliefs are, if you want to have an unbiased reflection of that, there are two documents that are high on the list that can help you. Look at your checkbook and ask yourself if the way that you're managing the resources that God has given you, are those deeds of the light? Do they reflect your belief in Jesus Christ as a savior of the world? Or not. The other document is your calendar. When we look at our calendars, we can ask ourselves, where am I spending my time? Is it all focused on me, myself, and I? Or how much of my time is focused on doing kingdom work and sharing with others? My guess is that when we do that, and I'll just speak for myself, when I do that, I don't get a clear picture. <laughs> In other words, I don't come away from looking at my checkbook or my calendar and say, oh, yes, I'm definitely, this is absolutely consistent with my belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Nor do I come away and say, oh, my gosh, this is so far from my beliefs. It's an absolute opposite of what I profess to believe. No, it's somewhere in between. There are things in my checkbook and in my calendar that would say to myself and others, that is, that is right in line with what I see is consistent with the kingdom and a belief and a profession in Jesus Christ as Lord of all. And there are parts of my calendar and my checkbook where you might and I might, if I'm honest, have to question, was that the best use of my fund? Could I have gotten something for less money and given the money, extra money to the poor or for God's work? Absolutely. There's many things in there that are not going to be as consistent with my beliefs than perhaps they could be. The same with my calendar. In other words, I don't know that it's as cut and dry as belief or unbelief. Those who believe save forever. Those who don't believe. I, 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 wonder, I wonder if that's just a fallacy of our own imaginations. That belief is more somewhere on a day-to-day -day journey with God. But let me take that to another step, and that is to ask us, what is it that causes us to come to belief in the first place? Did you come to believe something because you thought about it, because it made sense to you? Or how is it that you have come to believe 
in God through Christ at whatever level you would identify with at this point in your life. Richard Rohr wrote an essay called An Economy of Grace, and in there he says, only the soul can understand grace, never the mind or the ego. I think that what we might take away from that, which is absolutely consistent with and inspired by the comments of our staff and by Al Martinson, I think that what we might want to take away from this is the order of this passage. It sounds kind of simple, but let me highlight it. What comes first in this passage? God so loved the world. Take just that for a moment. No conditions, no parameters, no boundaries, no if, ands, or buts. God so loved the world that he did an action. It's not just a thought. It's not just an idea. It's not just a principle. No, 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 no. God so loved the world that he did something. And what did he do? He gave. Gave the absolute most precious gift that he could give his own son. Whew. It starts with God's love. And my guess is that there's not a single person. Now, this is a bold statement. Anybody's welcome to challenge me on it. But my guess is there's not a single person that has come to a belief that is followed up with actions and decisions that reflect those beliefs. There's not a single person that's come to that that didn't come to it by an experience of God's love. Belief isn't just saying, I believe this. It's not just a creed. Those are tools that help us come to a belief. Belief is about a relationship. It's about a conviction. It's about a transformation. It's about a heart that just wants to be a part of God's mission. We don't just think our way into that. And if we can resonate, if that seems to resonate with your own experience about how God works, then we have a God that is all about invitation and not imposition, inviting us into relationship, inviting us to be on this journey, inviting us to wrestle with questions, inviting us to engage in actions that would place us in the spaces where God's love may be most experienced. Worship, devotion, mission work. And God calls us, God calls us to do the same. In other words, we're free from needing to worry about who's in and who's out. We're free from needing to worry about who really believes and who kind of believes and who doesn't. But rather, we can just focus on growing in our capacity to love others the way God has loved us. In 1 John, not John chapter 1, but in, in the letter of 1 John, in chapter 4, verse 19, it says, we love because God first loved us. And so let us meditate on that love Meditate on the cost of that love and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Let us truly seek to place ourselves in the areas and spaces where God's love is most mediated. You can do that even if you don't feel like God loves you. You can do that even if you don't feel like you believe in God. And when you do that, you increase the possibilities that that love will continue to break down the hardness of our heart opening up the possibility of authentic belief. And so let us rejoice in the good news of a God who invites us into a great eternal relationship of love that begets love and brings the whole world into God's kingdom. Amen.
Let us go from this experience of worship with a renewed sense of the overwhelming, unimaginable, abundant grace and love of God who loved the whole world that he gave his son. Let that love go in us and fill us and overflow to others that we may indeed see all come into this relationship of joy and life in Christ. Go in peace.